with no hypothesis significance testing, we're interested in comparing two predictions or hypotheses about what will happen if we introduce an experimental manipulation or randomly sample a group and measure some dependent variable. In this case, let's say that we want to know what the effect of eating spinach has on IQ. And we have the prediction, or the hypothesis, that eating spinach should lead to greater IQ. The first thing that we do is we represent this prediction symbolically. So in this case, we have something called H0, which is our null hypothesis. This states that there should be no difference between a group that eats spinach and the group that does not eat spinach. In other words, there's no difference. There's no effect of introducing some experimental manipulation. In this case, we represent it symbolically with H0 representing the null hypothesis. And I say that mu, or the mean of my null distribution, is equal to the mu for my alternative. You can represent this as mu subscript 1, mu subscript s to represent spinach, anything that lets you know that these are two separate means. My alternative hypothesis, on the other hand, specifies that there should be an effect of eating spinach and that the IQ of the spinach eating group should be greater than the mean of the null distribution. This is an example of something called a directional or one-tailed significance test. This is important because when I evaluate the results of my experiment, they need to not only be past a certain threshold or cutoff, but they also need to be in the right direction. It needs to be greater than the null distribution. Our second step is we want to determine the characteristics of our comparison distribution. All the comparison distribution is, is a specification of what the null distribution should look like. So in this case, we had, for the population, let's say the mean IQ is 100 points. And we're going to just draw a normal looking curve right here. And I've already calculated my standard error, so I know what, on average, the error should be in my estimation of the mean of the null distribution. Simply the standard deviation, in other words, of the sampling distribution. So it's 1.5, so I know that in terms of raw IQ scores, if I go 1.5 in either direction, that's the same as going one standard deviation away from the mean. 98.5, 101.5. Going to go another standard deviation out. So now it's 97 and 103. Okay, simply taking two times the standard error. So I've written the sample mean scores on the bottom. On the top, I'm going to write the actual z-scores just for reference. So a mean of 101.5 corresponds to a z-score of positive 1. 103 corresponds to a z-score of positive 2. And the converse for the other side of the distribution. Now, let's determine what our cutoff threshold is going to be. I've stated here that I'm willing to reject a null hypothesis. If my sample mean that I take at random has a score that I would expect less than 5% of the time, just due to chance. And I know that for a directional one-tailed test, a cutoff of 0.05 corresponds to a z-score of 1.65. Now it's directional, so in particular, I'm looking for a score of greater than positive 1.65. My threshold is going to be about right here. Okay. This is also called alpha, so I'm going to mark that with the alpha symbol. 
Now all I do is I calculate the z-score for this sample mean that I drew, and I see where that falls in relation to this cutoff threshold. If it's more extreme, if it's beyond the border of my cutoff, I'm going to go ahead and reject the null hypothesis. If it's not, if it falls on this side of the cutoff threshold, I'm going to fail to reject the null hypothesis. So let's go ahead and calculate this here. So I have a mean for my sample of 105. So the z for this mean is going to be 105 minus the population mean, which is 100, and dividing by the standard error, which is 1.5. This corresponds to a z-score of about 3.33. So if I mark that down here, that's pretty high. I can mark the mean, which is 105. This is the raw score down here. Above that, I'm going to write the z-score, which is 3.33, positive 3.33. So you can see that it falls within this shaded rejection region, and I'm going to go ahead and reject the null hypothesis. Last thing to do is to actually write this in a format that can be communicated to anybody else. And I'm going to say that there was a significant effect of spinach on IQ. Z equals 3.33, P is less than 0.05. So those are the steps in a nutshell about how to conduct a very simple hypothesis test using this comparison distribution to see whether your results might be due to chance. One last thing we're going to talk about here. There are two types of errors we can commit. There's type 1 errors and there are type 2 errors. A type 1 error is when we reject the null when the null is actually true. In which case, we've simply obtained our result through a chance. There's no real effect or significant difference going on. You can only commit type 1 errors if you're in a situation where you have rejected the null hypothesis by definition. Likewise, if we had not rejected the null, let's say we'd found a z-score around here and we had not rejected the null, we could make a type 2 error, in which case we would fail to reject the null, but there actually is a significant difference. Okay. So let's think about it like this. You can only commit type 1 errors when you've rejected the null. You can only commit type 2 errors when you have failed to reject the null.